Uh, all right, I wanted to make sure I was recording us here. So um, we, we will have um, a lot to go through today. First of all, um, how's everybody doing? Keeping up with all the work in the course? <laughs> doing your best anyways? <laughs> yeah, we're we'll doing our best. All right. Good to hear. Um, best, yeah. Uh, I just, um, you know, want to continue to encourage everybody. Uh, I have not had the opportunity to get through all of your book reports yet, so I wanted to make sure I got those all back to you at the same time. Uh, so as I mentioned in my note in the classroom, since I was traveling last week, I didn't get, uh, usually I try to get those back within a week of when you submit them. So sorry for the hold up. Uh, should be over the next day or two that I get those back to you with some feedback. I know some of you are already working on your second book report. Uh, the book reports are looking great. You're, you're following instructions and doing well. So um, just a little general encouragement there. Uh, so, in, uh, and just a note for everybody um, that uh, Bekele is, uh, is joining us from China today. He's doing some traveling. Uh, so we'll keep uh, some of, you know, just mostly focus on general content for the course here. Uh, just keep that in mind. And I know we have people kind of calling in from all over the place from the U.S. and from Africa. Uh, so I thank you for these uh, Zoom room times and, um, you know, your your commitment to to joining and being present. Uh, I wanted to uh, – oh, welcome, Joe. Glad you're here. Uh wanted to go over uh i'll flip things up a little bit so i was going to start with dr smith and then i was going to move into covering uh exegeting the city or exegeting your community uh, and then i was going to talk a little bit about the interview questions uh for your for your uh journals as well um but uh why don't i just i'll switch things up and then like i said when when brad's able to jump on then we'll we'll uh let him take over um but what i wanted to draw your attention to was uh, we'll start with the six interview questions. And uh, as a reminder from the syllabus, so if you're ever confu confused about anything uh, from the course, please just check out the syllabus and read through the directions again, and then you can email me always directly uh, with any questions that you might have. And a lot of you are doing that. So again, that's really appreciated. Uh, the, uh, the assignment for the Discovery and Reflection Journal was uh, in week one, you were gonna identify uh, six uh, different urban leaders in your city, preferably those who have been transformational. And then you need to contact them and set up your appointments during week one, prepare your interview questions. I saw a lot of you were kind of sharing interview questions. We didn't have a set set of questions, but uh, just kind of in general, um, there were some questions. And then also in that exegeting the city document that I had sent out to everybody, uh, there were some great questions in there too. And again, we'll be going over all that in just a minute. Uh, and then during weeks two through seven of the online course, you'll go and interview as transformational leaders in your city and keep a reflective journal about your discoveries and reflections. Each week's entry will consist of three distinct parts, description analysis and application and integration. So, uh, some of you had sent me uh, your journal entries uh, already, uh, which is fine. I was happy to kind of take a look at those and then get some feedback to you. Uh, if, if you're curious if you're on the right track or not with your journal entries, that's okay. Uh, actually, those won't be due until the end of the, um, until the, end of the course. So in your, final, uh, in your final project, your final document, you will have your, uh, uh, you know, descriptions in your reflection journal of the interviews that you have with the leaders. So that would be, you know, description would be, you know, who is this person? When did you interview them? Some of the basics, uh, a little bit about them. And then analysis of what they said. You know, I want you to use your critical thinking skills to kind of think through, oh, wow, they said this thing that just really blew my mind and I'm, it still stayed with me. It's changing me, you know, as my approach. I, I, it made me rethink things. Or it could be something that, that they said during the course of the interview that troubled you or that you disagreed with. And that's okay as well. Um, you know, so, it, and it could be anything in between, but you're kind of analyzing what they said. And then the third part of your journal entry would be, uh, what can you integrate into your context and your leadership in light of your time that you spent interviewing this transformational leader in your city? Uh, and again, these leaders can be, powerful people, powerless people. They can be 
in institutions that are kind of dispersed throughout your uh, city. They could be right there in your local neighborhood on your on your street. You could do all six of them right on your street if you want to with your neighbors uh, <laughs> or uh, however you want to do it. But um, the uh, I'll trust you to kind of select the six that you're interviewing. And if you're a little bit behind, that's okay. You'll make it up here as we go through the course. If you're way ahead, I had, I think one of you, I can't remember which one it was, but sent me a note that you had already uh, completed all of your interviews, which is great. Uh, but you'll just, uh, you know, continue to incorporate maybe each week in your reflection journal, if you're kind of ahead, uh, you can focus on one of those uh, leaders that you, that you uh, interviewed. So uh, again, and, and the key thing with the journal entries is that you don't want to wait all the way until the end of the course uh, to kind of crank out your, uh, your journal reflections. You're going to want to uh, make sure that you uh, are uh, uh, keeping up with that every week as you go through. So let me pause there and see if there are any questions that anyone has about the uh, interview questions and, and then the reflection journal. Yes. Yeah. Um... I want to really get it clear. Do we need to write out all what we interacted with the persons? That is all our interaction with the person. Do we need to write all that? Do you, uh, can you, do you need to write all of what? All the interactions we had with the person who we are interviewing. Do we need to write everything uh, the person said? Nope. So, so the, uh, in general, uh, you do not need to write out all of the questions and answers that you had with that person. We're really just looking for, in that description time, let's say that you asked them 10 questions. Maybe there were one or two questions that were really, you know, you got some good answers on and you could, you know, say specifically what that question was. And then if you wanted, depending on how you're taking notes, some people like to do an audio recording of the interview and then go back through and transcribe it and then you could include maybe one or two of their concise answers uh, to incorporate into your journal uh, to be honest that's a really time consuming approach to doing the interviews is to go back and listen to this transcription um, when you're moving closer to your research goals for your for your doctoral dissertation or your final project for your master's uh, program uh, you'll definitely want to practice what works best for you uh, in terms of doing interviews and getting fresh research and things like that. So all that to say, you don't have to list out all the questions and answers. I'm really just looking for a summary in the descriptions uh, section. And then I'm more looking for you. How are you interacting with that content? I don't want to hear everything that they had to say necessarily. I want to hear what you think about what they had to say in light of this transformational leadership course that we're taking. Dr. Brian, two pages for journals? Yes, two pages, and if you absolutely have to go to three, uh, maybe because you have a picture of you and the person that you interviewed, or uh, you know, some some creative graphics or something, then you, you know, again, if you go to three pages, even with some written content, I'm not going to mark you down. Thank you. Thank you. And part of that, uh, part of that, that's a good question, Star, because part of what is important is to. Uh, be concise in academic writing, which is a really, uh, it's, it's a challenging thing for a lot of people to do is to be concise, is to really think through your sentence structures and what you're writing out. Um, and it's different than how we communicate kind of in real life where if we were just sitting here talking to each other or if you were just to write out a reflection. So uh, yeah, do try to try to be as concise as you can. Any other questions on the reflection journal or interview questions? And, and how are some of your interviews going? Why don't some of you can jump in, even if you don't have a question, maybe you can share about a good interview that you had or something like that. Yeah, let, let me share one. Um, I'm almost through with my interviews. I've done five. And I'm hoping to do one today for the days off. Appointment for eight. Uh, one of the, I interviewed a community chief and um, it was finding it difficult to understand my questions. Uh, I keep going back and back and back. I keep explaining 
uh, each question I have to do a long as time to say. So it was somehow clumsy and uh, but patience, I had to learn patience, uh, talking with him and to uh, reduce my level of grammar so that I can understand what I'm trying to ask him. So it was an exciting experience. <laughs> That's good. So what methods are you using to record the interviews? Are you, uh, I think you were saying a little bit about that, but what's working best for you in terms of gathering that whole mound of, of data? I record, I do recording, yeah. Okay. I record the interaction, then I come back and transcribe it. That is the method that is best for me, transcribe it, then I will not go over it again and again and bring out the points uh, for analysis. Uh, that's the part I'm using. Because I might not be able to get everything while they are talking. I might miss some points while they are talking that might be very important to me. So I record, come back, transcribe our interaction, then uh, I think I was, I've not started analysis, I've not started analysis, I'm just gathering all the interviews so that I will analyze them. Okay. That's great. Thank you for, thank you for sharing. I think your microphone went off there, but that's good. So everybody can kind of hear what you're saying. And also, uh, one thing to consider, so you're doing all these interviews for this course, and then you're gonna provide a, a summary in your journal, and you may incorporate some of their quotes into your, into your final project. Uh, but also keep in mind that as many of you are moving towards your final dissertations or your final projects, your capstone projects, uh, to keep those interview transcripts uh, in a handy place uh, that are organized so that you might actually wanna go back and reference some of those interviews to back up your, your statements and your findings when you move into your, into your dissertation stage. And if you're just starting out, that might seem like it's really long, like far away, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's, uh, it's important to keep those on file because within a couple of years, you're gonna start, uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna take your research bridge class and you'll start down that path. And so it'll be good to have some of those interviews uh, on hand. Um, Star, how did uh, I know you were um, tinkering with your with your interviews a bit, and we had talked about doing some different. Then you had maybe talked about uh, trying to track down some some young people who were impacted, potentially impacted by uh, what your nonprofit might do. Are you having any success with that? Um, I decided to go ahead and interview um, people from from the city college and. Um, sanctuary, different places that they would end up. Um, I'm really even changing my questions and how I'm handling it because it's so much information and it's, it, um, I really would like to do the research on the person before I go so I don't have to ask all those questions and then I can really get the meat of what I need because uh, my first interview kind of went a little long so I'm, I'm kind of changing things up, but um, I am overwhelmed with what's happening with the foster youth right now. Not the project, I'm overwhelmed. I don't know where they are. I don't know what's happened. Monies have been cut mm. in so many different areas. And so um, it's just really interesting talking to the different people and, and understanding where these young people are. So I'm going to the sanctuary actually today um, is a shelter, 24 hour shelter that in our city, they have closed three shelter. They're not shelters. They were homes that they could live in. So they've closed three big facilities. Uh, they've been defunded where the youth are. I don't know. Wow. And so I'm going to find out today from the shelter. They said that they only have 24 hours to stay there. So I'm not going in with a bunch of questions. I'm going to give them uh, the definition of transformational leader, uh, leadership from, uh, from our class and, you know, introduce myself that way and, and um, let them know that I chose them for that reason because I feel that they're uh, transformational leaders. And um, I'm just going to put it, I'm just going to give my questions. I, I want to know where, you know, where are the youth and, and what is your services? How, how are we, 
how are we facing this thing? Um, and it's interesting because I have, um, I have an appointment with uh, the president of Fresno City College here. And I'm going to ask her that question. What, what, is, you know, what, is, what are we doing about the foster youth in this city who now have, they, they've been displaced? What, my whole nonprofit is, concern, is um, about education. Well, we can't even think about education when there's no home, there's no food, there's no, you know, there's so many big, big um, questions that need to be answered. So I'm, I'm in search of that. Yeah. That's great. And when I think about this, uh, thanks for sharing about that. When I think about this course and our role as transformational leaders connecting, uh, you know, instead of just focusing on kind of keeping our head down in our work and getting immersed in that, but uh, being transformational and that we uh, reach out equally to the powerful and the powerless. That's a really great example of how, um, you know, connecting with someone like the president of that college uh, could really be a powerful opportunity. Who knows what's going to happen in the midst of that. So thank you for sharing about that. Who else? How are your interviews going? Who wants to share? I can share, um, I have done uh, three so far. Um, <clears throat> um, I think two in the same, same day. Um, and uh, the second one is uh, just uh, a few days ago. Um, uh, this, these are very, very busy leaders and uh, now God is using them really to change so many lives and uh, properly, I may not uh, mention the details, but um, what really, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. So um, I just prepare a few, few, few questions and, um, but as we sit down, those questions really expanded to more other questions. And um, so I just asked a few questions like, um, you know, the basic principles of what makes them or how they end up in where they are now because of their uh, huge influence and impact in the lives of uh, others. So um, I just learned a lot of things. And um, so I'm still um, heading for another three, uh, which in the next uh, week, um, I'm planning. Um, so, so much excited uh, with the three I have done. Great. That's good to hear. Thank you for that update. Uh, and Florine wrote in the chat room, I have done three so far, want to do two institutions that link with them to complete my overviews. And uh, that's great. As you, as you start into your uh, interviews, you might uh, get some recommendations from some of the people that you started interviewing that, that might send you in another direction. Um, so, uh, so that's great. Um, so thank you for sharing, Bekele. Uh, we'll look forward to hearing about uh, how those go and uh, glad to hear that that's going well. Anyone else, any thoughts or questions about the interviews in the Reflection Journal? And by the way, in your reflection journal, you can include other content from the course. So, uh, you know, it, it doesn't have to be solely focused on just your interviews. So if you have like a week four, uh, you know, journal time, there could be something that, uh, I'm sorry, in your week four journal, you could have information about your interviews and that's great. I want you to focus on those because that's part of the assignment. Uh, but then also you might say, hey, in the Zoom room, uh, this came up and I've really been thinking about that and wrestling with that since then. Or I heard one of my colleagues say something uh, that, that gave me some passion and uh, here's how I'm trying to implement that. Uh, could be something with the readings that we have for the week, uh, any of those things. So just keep that in mind as well. All right. Well, uh, uh, and I also wanted to, I'm trying to keep up with your, uh, with Florine so that you can get in the conversation here. Um, she just said, I'm also trying to get one with an institution that has been focusing on poverty. Hope to do that as well. That's great. Keep trying to find those leaders and, and the, the people in the key areas and even people that might not be, you know, the most obvious ones that you would talk to. 
Uh, what I want to do now then, uh, again, as we're waiting on uh, Dr. Smith here, uh, I'll move into the exegeting the city document and uh, we'll kind of work through that a little bit. I'm actually going to share my screen and um, I don't know if I'll be able to see if Dr. Smith joins us while I share my screen here. So if, if on your microphone, if one of you could let me know if you see him pop into the, uh, to the Zoom room here, uh, I'd appreciate that. But let me go ahead and um, share my screen here. And actually, I'm going to share the actual Word document. Here we go. We'll go full screen here. So uh, on this document, get to the top here so I first wanted to say that when I threw this out uh, and I, I in the you know the assignment was for weeks two through four uh, I know a lot of you got it and the first response I got from some of you was oh my goodness what is this document that he just sent us I can't do all of that I'm overwhelmed so <laughs> so I just want to say up front that I'm not expecting you to do everything that is on the exegeting the city uh, document that I sent out. Those are just resources for, to, for you to kind of have on hand as you're exegeting your community or your city. And uh, I wanted to walk through it a little bit here in week four, uh, because uh, in weeks five and beyond, you'll be working with your groups to coach each other up on uh, how to exegete your city. So the basic concept, I'm not going to go through every part of the document word for word, but I'll go through some of the high level. And then if you have any questions, just take note of those questions and uh, I'll follow back around with you uh, to uh, answer those questions. But, you know, exegesis, you can see it's the, the Greek meaning to lead out of or read what's important. Uh, normally we would do that with a biblical text to look for what we can kind of get out of a biblical text that we're reading. Uh, the concept for cities would be how do we do that in a city or in a neighborhood again for some of you city is kind of a, a loose term it, it could be your own community your immediate neighborhood that you're going to get to know or it could be your entire metropolitan region if you live in a large city or you work in a large city so that that kind of has different meetings uh the city walk uh, so a lot of this content I pulled from some of the leaders like Ray Bakke, Ron Boyce, Ben Beltran, and, and Randy White. These are different approaches to getting to know your community. And that's really what the assignment is for you. Uh, you're just going to take the opportunity to get to, your, to know your community. So just like Paul in Athens in Acts 17, if you have a chance to read through that, uh, I would recommend that you can do that. But it's going through and observing for cultural clues and symbols for things that might help you to connect with people in that neighborhood. And exegeting communities is another way of saying networking the communities. Uh, and so what you're looking for, as I mentioned, is, is what uh, Dr. White calls clues to cultural values like symbols and characteristics. You could just take a walk around your neighborhood and take a notebook with you and write down the signs of hope that you see on one page and the signs of need that you see on another page. And then you could do that walk during the daytime and you could do that walk at nighttime if it's safe enough where you are. You could have someone come with you uh, if you don't feel safe. I've done that before in my neighborhood. Just walk around, look for signs of hope, look for signs of need. One of my projects I actually did for, it was for Dr. White's class. I did an immersion with him in Latin America. And then uh, for my class project, I did a signs of hope and a signs of need assessment on Homewood, the neighborhood here in Pittsburgh, uh, where I'm located. And as I walked around during the day, signs of hope that I saw were institutions like libraries, schools, people. I described some of the people that I saw and that I talked to. Uh, and then at nighttime, uh, there were some different things that I saw, you know, so signs of need included uh, even during the day or at night included like boarded up homes. Uh, you know, right next to me, there is a, uh, 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 was a shooting uh, in the house where a person was killed and there's a shrine that the neighborhood uh, family members made for them kind of right on the street, right outside my house. That's a sign of, I guess, a sign of need. Uh, that, that that is a heartbreaking circumstance that happened in the neighborhood. 
um, but <laughs> a sign of hope and that people are healing and that people are going through a grief process that um, for me as a pastor in the neighborhood, helping that family and my neighbors to be able to navigate through that. Uh, and so you can take the time to share some of those stories based off of things that you might see. Uh, at the end of my street, there is, uh, there were at one point, six abandoned houses that were all boarded up and they were being used as drug houses. So uh, what my neighbors and I did is we went on kind of a letter writing and advocacy campaign and we worked with a, a local nonprofit organization to the point today where five out of those six abandoned houses uh, have been uh, demolished. One of them, the structure was, was nice enough for it to be restored and the city actually was able to help get through the red tape to get the nonprofit organization to get a hold of that to that property to refurbish it. And then there's an urban garden that has been placed that is that is uh, that nonprofit organization and my neighbors work together to keep the um, that uh, those lots going as a place to grow food. We get to go over there anytime and, and harvest the vegetables and and fruit as long as we kind of help out a little bit to grow them. And uh, it's been a really great partnership. I mentioned only five of the six, though, uh, of those um, properties were are being repurposed. One of them is still an abandoned house that uh, there's all kinds of crazy illegal activity that happens in that house. And uh, due to red tape, we have not been able to do anything about that. It still kind of sits there and has all kind of drug activity and illegal activity. So our neighbors are continuing the fight to... Um, to get a hold of that and repurpose that property as well. So those are some examples of walking through a neighborhood. Signs of hope that you might see would be a, an urban garden and a refurbished home that was once boarded up. A sign of need would be an abandoned home that where there was uh, where there are drug needles and things like that. And uh, I would I would say that that's kind of a place where transformation is needed. And then you're going to see a lot of ordinary things in between. You're going to stop and talk to people, ask them some good questions when you stop and talk to your neighbors. Uh, again, this could happen in any part of your city. You might go to one of the busiest blocks in your city that you don't know very well and just do a walk around and do a signs of hope and a signs of need assessment. So uh, when you uh, are exegeting your city, that's helping you to get to know it. You know, where, where are the signs of hope and where are the signs of need? Uh, moving to the summary, some summary assumptions that the idea of, of about the idea of exegeting a city. These are from Ray Bakke. Uh, it talks a lot about in there. What I wanted to highlight is that is that we are committed both to the spiritual transformation of persons and the social transformation of places. This is a big deal for transformational leaders, uh, where many people are simply focused on individual growth. Transformational leaders are focused on the place where they are and the people collectively in that place growing and thriving as well. So as you walk around the neighborhood, uh, those are some things to think through. What would that look like for everybody in your neighborhood or your city to thrive? What would it look like for the places to be uh, redeemed or transformed into uh, healthy places for human beings to gather, whether that's businesses or schools or um, you know, any institutions in, in, your, in your city? Uh, the next bullet point there, uh, the ecological view, he talks about Luther and Calverson, but basically he's talking about common grace, uh, where, um, where there are good schools, health systems, economies, employment, freedoms, and security. What does that look like when you walk around the neighborhood? What would it look like for everybody to be thriving and all the institutions to be working together? And where are the gaps that you see as you're getting to know where you are? So I'm gonna skip down there then to some primary steps to exegeting communities. Those I had kind of mentioned already, but you could visit every member of your congregation where they work. If, if uh, you're involved in that kind of work, uh, then you could go ahead and, and visit people where they, where they work in the marketplace, get to know them. I can share firsthand that uh, the, the people that I'm involved with in my local community and congregation, they love it when I visit them at work and I get to know what they're doing and the importance of their calling that they have. Map the assets of your community. That's a classic community development approach from McKnight and Kretzmann's book, Building Communities from the Inside Out. I actually have that book as one of the, the books from my uh, poverty and social justice course that I teach. Uh, but it's a powerful way to map out 
when you go out into your neighborhood or into your city and then you're out there, take a notebook with you and act, you can actually make a map of your community and map out the assets. Yes, you're going to see some signs of brokenness, but what are, what are some good things in your neighborhood? The story needs to be told. The narrative needs to be adjusted that something hopeful is happening in your, in your place versus the narrative of brokenness and need that so often gets communicated. Transformational leaders are able to map out the assets in their neighborhoods and then work towards the transformation of those places by building on the assets in the people and in those places. And then visit every uh, uh, place of worship in your community, first to learn of their histories, calling and calling, but also to thank them for serving the community and helping people that you will never reach. And then this is a great question to ask. What is the most important lesson that you have learned in serving your community? To ask that of other leaders in your neighborhood is really a powerful way to get to know people, to come in with an attitude of listening. Uh, for some of you, you might not have uh, a local place of worship focus, but you might focus more on uh, visit every other social organization or community, such as schools, police, hospitals, fire departments, and businesses. Uh, you can meet with realtors to get to know the housing market. Uh, you know, there's so many different things that you could do to get up-to-date information on your neighborhood. And the main thing is whether you're involved with a business or a nonprofit or whatever organization you're connected to is that you then become an expert that people go to in your area to learn more about your, your city. Uh, he even says pubs can teach you a lot. I'm not going to endorse everyone to do that. Maybe some of you will uh, stop by the local pub and get to know some people. Uh, but uh, feel free to apologize for not coming to them sooner. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of ways that you can get to know people by asking good questions and interviewing. So I uh, just wanted to, share that those before I jump into any further part of the document I wanted to keep it really basic at the start here and just say this is what exegeting exegeting a community is you can do it by walking around your neighborhood by driving to, or taking public transportation to a place and just looking and taking good notes and describing what you see and uh, also getting to know some people along the way so before I move into the rest of the of the document here, that's a little bit more technical. And again, I'm not going to go through every single part. Are there any questions uh, that you have about the first part of the document here? All right. Well, we'll keep plugging through. And if you have any, uh, did someone raise a hand or, or no? Okay, go ahead. Oh, your microphone's not on. You know, maybe I can, maybe you can't talk while I'm sharing the screen. So let me try, I'll try to stop share. All right, uh, there you go. Okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. So <laughs> yeah, I have, um, just one basic question. Um, in visiting your local church members in their place of work, how many can you visit? In visiting the churches in your community, how many can you visit? In visiting the schools, how many can you visit? Because one, I don't think we'll be able to visit all the churches in our community because in Nigeria we have so many churches. Just my neighborhood alone, we should have so many churches. Um, uh, a congregation of 400, how many members can I visit in their place of work? If there is a minimum number, I, I think I will. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I would suggest, uh, you know, everybody's capacity is different. Uh, what I would do is, as I kind of said, maybe set out a day, like dedicate a day to this, at least one day, and then what could you logically do? So maybe you would spend a couple hours in the morning doing a neighborhood walk, doing a signs of hope and a signs of need assessment in your notebook, and then arrange for a lunch appointment with one you know, uh, of the people that go to your uh, congregation that you could visit where they work. And when you're selecting that person, try to think uh, strategically, um, you know, about who that person would be. You know, it could be someone that you're really intrigued by uh, 
by what they do. They could be an influence maker in your city that uh, would be a really strategic uh, move for you. Or it could be somebody who's kind of marginalized that goes to your congregation that might be really surprised that you showed up at their work and they might even feel a little bit embarrassed that you would uh, want to come and see them where they work. But for you, it would be an opportunity to get to know them a little bit better and just say, I just really just want to kind of see what your world is like. And um, could you show me around your, your factory or could you show me, <laughs> could you show me around uh, your office place? And it's funny, the times that I've done this in Pittsburgh, it always cracks me up that people don't know how to introduce me. Uh, you know, uh, this is my friend, Brian, or, you know, some of them are, this is, I've talked about my faith so much here, you know, and this is the person that I've, you know, it's just really, it's, it's interesting to see. So I would say at least one or two uh, people visit where they work if you're going to do that in a day. Uh, and then maybe you would spend your afternoon then strategically uh, visiting some of the other local church. And I would pick different uh, different institutions that are different from your expression of, of faith. So try, I would say, I know, try to pick something. Uh, for me, for example, uh, Catholics, like I, I did not grow up like that. I don't understand it. And so for me, that was an opportunity to kind of reach out uh, and to some of those leaders in our city, which has a big presence in, in Pittsburgh, and to, to intentionally schedule some time with them. And those ended up being some of my best meetings that I had. So I would say focus more on quality than on quantity would be my suggestion. Uh, you know, you don't need to blaze through five or 10 work visits. It's really just about getting out and, and getting used to this. Sound good? Thank you, I'm good, thank you. All right. Any other uh, questions or comments? All right. Well, we will move into. Uh, oh, I pressed the wrong button. Sorry one, sorry, one more question. Sure. Yeah. Is it is it okay for me to have a team to walk with me? To have who walk with you? A team. Oh yes, that's the best way to do it. <laughs> a group of people uh, that we can go, everybody check, we compare notes and discuss about what we have seen, and I come up with a, with a summary of all our experiences. Yeah, that, oh well, my goodness, that's like, that's the, uh, that's the dream scenario right there. So, uh, because again, if you think about the BGU approach, uh, we don't train up like individual leaders who are just going to get smarter about their knowledge of leadership. We want you to, we know that you're influencers in your area and that you have people that, you know, sometimes as a leader, you have to look around and say, who's actually following here. And so that's a great example of bringing some other people with you for the adventure. Uh, any given time, if you, if you just, you know, flew into Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania uh, I can't say it would be every week, but uh, you would probably see me with a group of people uh, walking around the neighborhood or uh, I love to show off the neighborhood and I would have never done that before I took a Baki course. It was only afterwards I realized, oh, I'm supposed to bring other people along. And so uh, I love now that I know my city really well in my neighborhood really well to do uh, driving tours and walking tours and urban immersion opportunities. So yes, please do that. That would be great. Bring your team. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, we'll keep working through the, uh, the document a bit here. All right. So here's where we're, uh, as I've mentioned to, to you previously, uh, one of the things that we're trying to emphasize at BGU is critical thinking, is next layer thinking. So uh, it's good to walk through the neighborhood and to see the signs of hope and signs of need. And that's going to be enough to complete the assignment and do well on it. So again, there's no pressure to, to um, you know, move any further than that. I really just want you to try to get to know your neighborhoods. And then when you report out in your final project, uh, you're going to describe uh, what you saw or some of your findings on exegeting your city. I would say 
that some of this next content then, for instance, these six principles of urban geography, these are critical thinking questions. These are categories for you to be able to kind of process through what you're learning and what you're seeing. And if you wanna to go to the next level with some of the questions that you're asking to get to know your city, uh, these six principles of urban geography from Ron Boyce, I had an opportunity to spend some time with him when I took a BGU class in Seattle, Washington. And he has some great resources. This is just one of the resources, uh, but he has some great resources on helping leaders to be equipped to get to know your city. So I included this in here because some of you, I know you're not all sociologists or urban geographers and things like that, but these categories, each of them has questions to help you to get to know your city a little bit better. So looking down the list here uh, in this document, you know, the, the um, you know, cities are interconnected and what is your city interconnected with? All of these things, the closer things are to one another, the more likely they are to interact with one another. And those are some questions there to help you to kind of dive a little bit deeper. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm not gonna do a deep dive on that one, but I just wanted to kind of highlight it. I did wanna say that uh, this next one from Ron Boyce, exegeting cities at the macro, meso, and micro level, that's actually you know kind of three good categories that, uh, that you could take a look at to uh, help you along in your journey. So here's, so here's an example of how I would apply that. If the city is Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, at the macro level, cities are seen as points. How does this city relate with other cities? How does it rank in the urban hierarchy? How is it different from other cities? So on a macro level, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, for many years, it was known for steel. We had a huge steel industry that impacted the entire globe. Many buildings that were built around the world were, uh, were built out of uh, steel that was made in Pittsburgh. Uh, more recently, we have a professional football team called the Pittsburgh Steelers. The Super Bowl is coming up this week. Unfortunately, the, uh, the Steelers did not make the Super Bowl this year. Uh, but uh, the, the Pittsburgh Steelers have won six world championships, so they're kind of known nationally and globally for – professional football and our hockey team, the Pittsburgh Penguins. Uh, also, somebody who just joined, uh, if you could, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, also, there's a company called Uber that is uh, has its headquarters is based in, um, in Pittsburgh, where they have their driverless cars. There's a huge robotics industry in Pittsburgh. So you'll see cars driving around the city without any drivers in them, which is pretty interesting to see. Uh, also, we have Carnegie Mellon University, which attracts students from all over the world. And at the macro level, these are some of the things. Uh, again, somebody's, uh, somebody's microphone is on, and there's a lot of background noise, so. Ah, uh, thank you. I think it's getting better there. Okay, uh, an example of the of the meso level for Pittsburgh is uh, cities are viewed as areas or sites. So, what are the basic topographical features of the built environment, neighborhood boundaries, use of land, chief characteristics of its special interaction? Who makes up the social fabric of the city? How does ethnicity or social class affect life or social interaction here? Uh, and Pittsburgh actually has a really cool story of this. Ray Bakke visited our city in Pittsburgh about 20 years ago at the invitation of the Pittsburgh Leadership Foundation. And he did a whole bunch of research before he arrived. And when he met with the city leaders here, he kind of blew everybody away with all the different descriptions of the neighborhoods and the different groups of people that had made up Pittsburgh. Uh, and it was a really great opportunity for these leaders to get to know their city even more. And they could have done it on their own by going to the library and doing some research and walking around the neighborhoods. Uh, but Pittsburgh is a city of neighborhoods. It's a blue collar area that's trans transitioning into a higher eds and meds and technology sector. So it's undergoing a renaissance after going through an economic depression. Uh, it's actually uh, kind of bouncing back. Uh, cities in this part of the United States, when they start to struggle, they're called rust belt cities. Uh, and that means when, whenever industry and manufacturing declines, each of these cities are older cities that are trying to reinvent themselves. So Pittsburgh is doing that uh, as, as best as it can, but we have a lot of hills in our topography and a lot of different neighborhoods. Um, 
that I'll talk about in just a second. Uh, but we also have the people here. We are mostly uh, Caucasian and African American uh, and uh, a relatively small Asian and uh, Latino population uh, in, in Pittsburgh as compared to some other cities that I've lived in that have uh, diversity in lots of other different areas. Uh, and then at the micro level, cities are neighborhoods. Pittsburgh has 90 different neighborhoods and everybody who's from each neighborhood will tell you all about their neighborhood, but they won't go into the next neighborhood. Uh, people don't cross bridges. We have three big rivers in the city of Pittsburgh and people don't cross over a river to go into other people's neighborhoods. It's really funny uh, how they just kind of stick to their own neighborhoods. Uh, and there's a lot of boundaries between neighborhoods uh, throughout these, these 90 different parts of, of Pittsburgh neighborhoods. Uh, but there's also a lot of great people there. And then uh, the, the location where I serve as a multi-site pastor, uh, we have six different locations around the city of, of places that we've planted uh, that have been uh, you know, on different parts of town and different parts of the region. And that's been a really interesting thing for us to try and navigate. Navigate. We have to take into account uh, what's going on at the micro level to contextualize to the different neighborhoods in order to be effective. But we also kind of have a main overarching structure with our planting model uh, that is really helpful. So, uh, wanted to pause right there. Maybe some of you, uh, in this question that I would ask, uh, where, does, where is your city or community kind of oriented at the macro level, at the meso level, and at the neighborhood level? Are there any insights as I was describing my city a little bit that you might want to share about your particular context? Who wants to share? Go ahead. I know it's kind of intimidating, but he just wants to tell me, like, how is your city known nationally or around your continent? Or uh, and then what are you kind of known for uh, in your particular part of town? Just to, just to keep it simple. Well, Fresno is known as the um, uh, breadbasket of the world. And um, we have a lot of churches here. We're known for a lot of churches and a lot of crime and poverty. Right. And a lot of um, rest, what do you call it? Um, restoration. There's just a lot of good things happening here as well. Yeah. So it's kind of a, a national model. A lot of people are looking at Fresno as a place that has a lot of transformation going on and a lot of great leaders who are doing community development there. But also you're right. It's, it's ironic that there's uh, you know, so much food that is grown there and that there's so much poverty and people don't have enough food uh, that live there. So Amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's exactly what I'm talking about. So everybody else, if you're intimidated to talk about the document, don't be. Can you share a little bit about what your city is known for? Yeah, uh, my city, I live in Abuja in Nigeria. Abuja is the capital the uh, capital of Nigeria, where we have the fastest growing city in my country, uh, a lot of developments going on, a lot of um, uh, immigration, population is rising uh, every moment, and um, we still have a lot of um, in local settlements. Uh, the city's design is such a way that you see high rise settlements, then local settlements just side by side, and you'll see the difference so, so much, so clear. Um, where the rich people live and where the poor people live, it's just a fence that demarcates them. But where the rich people live is fully developed. Where the poor people live is not developed at all. No roads there, um, but they have lights. But no roads, no social amenities like water and the rest of them. Uh, the city has good road networks, very good roads, the best in the club of West Africa. 
with um, a lot of, it just recently, just in the past two, three years, that crime began to increase in the city. Uh, before two, three years, it was so peaceful, no crime, no incidents of um, theft or molestation. But just in the past two years, because of the insurgents in the north, a lot of them have moved down to the city. So there's a lot of um, instability, insecurity now in the city. Uh, just Yes. Okay. Did you get? Did you get that? Um, yeah. Uh, so you were you were breaking up a little bit, but we definitely caught the gist of what you were saying. Um, yeah. Did you hear me? Yeah. Did you hear me? Yeah. I, we caught a lot of it that you were saying. Yep, we just did. I, you were breaking up a little bit at the end there, but thank you for sharing that. And uh, you know, not to use generalities too much, but uh, the African urban population is growing uh, tremendously, and that's why it's particularly important that so many um, students from Africa are taking these BGU courses to to help be equipped to keep up with that growth. And um, that's excellent uh, the, of your assessment. So thank you for sharing some of what. Uh, uh, from your context. Uh, I want to share a little bit um, that what Florine wrote in the chat column. Georgetown was known decades ago as the garden city of the Caribbean and the breadbasket of the Caribbean. And um, now we are not the garden city. However, many Brazilians live in Guyana, many involved in gold and diamond mining. And the last year or so, we have Cubans visiting much for business. Many Chinese are in Georgetown and involved in business. This is in the last decade or so. So uh, uh, Florian, thank you for sharing that about your context. Uh, interesting to hear some about that history and that, that Georgetown is also similar to Pittsburgh in kind of a transitional uh, season in their, in their history. Um, can we, uh, Baxter, since you have a connection now, could you share a little bit about your city? Are you able to get your microphone going? I can share until. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Michaela. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I live in Addis Ababa. Addis Ababa uh, is one of the uh, fastest growing city uh, in Africa. Uh, it's becoming the hub of Africa, and also uh, it's a capital city for uh, the office for AU in Addis Ababa. And uh, uh, if, if I'm correct, Addis Ababa is becoming probably the third or the fourth uh, diplomatic city in the world next to, I think, uh, New York and some other cities because of um, so many um, uh, Africans and Asians are just coming in. So uh, with that, there are a lot of development. And also uh, in Ethiopia, it's, a, it's the only bigger city where uh, people can find jobs. And so you can find many beggars on the street. Uh, people are just flooding from uh, all the, the corners to um, just uh, flooding into Addis from, um, you know, 80% of the rural area, uh, which is surrounding. So it's a, a huge uh, mix of uh, high level economic growth and also uh, the poverty uh, areas and, and so many straits, so many uh, people on, on uh, just uh, uh, everywhere fallen in. So, uh, it's just um, very hard to express what's happening there. It's great. Yeah, it, it's amazing to try to think about trying to keep up with the growth of people coming. Uh, I was in, I think I might have shared this story already, but I was in Mumbai a few years ago. And, and the city of Pune and Mumbai are going to uh, really within the next few years, they're going to be a mega city of 50 million people. I've heard a similar description. I'm not sure if that will happen in Addis uh, or not, but um, many African cities are that same of uh, 
within the next few years that are 50 or 60 million people, which is hard to even comprehend. So glad you're there in the middle of that um, to try to <laughs> lead through it. Joe, did, did you want to share a little bit? Yeah. Um, okay. I, I live in the capital of uh, Arare, Arare, the city. It's, uh, it used to be, our country used to be the breadbasket of Africa. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yep. Okay. Um, a land of sunshine, uh, lots of sunshine here and beauty. And unfortunately, things have changed. And there's a lot of vendors in the city. Uh, a lot of um, uh, uh, Chinese people also in the city, coming into the city. It has become so congested. Um, a lot of traffic, a lot of... Um, challenges, a lot of poverty as well. So we have extreme, extreme challenges that uh, require transformation. So I'm glad that I'm on this course to, to be instrumental in God's hands to bring about change. So what would That's you say? what I can say. Yeah, well, Joe, what would you say is the biggest challenge that, that your city is facing or that you're directly involved with? Um, I, I think it's um, unemployment is very high, extremely high, um, and and I think the government is trying to to recover that. They're trying to address that by opening the uh, the country to other international communities to come in and 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 invest in the country. So that's our greatest challenge at the moment: unemployment. Um, yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you for sharing. Um, and then uh, can we try to get uh, Baxter? Are you able to share a little bit? Is your mic working? Okay, can you get me? Oh, there you go, okay. Can you get me? I can hear you, yeah. All right, um, I live in Dola, uh, in Zambia. And, and, and I'm not very, my, 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 my brother who is in Harare. Harare. Um, it is uh, on the copper belt of Zambia. Zambia is a copper producing country. Uh, it is on the copper belt and it's uh, HQ of the copper belt, although there's no mine in Indola. Um, uh, but um, this way, it's, uh, it's called the friendly city for whatever reason. <laughs> and I think we are, we are friendly a lot. Uh, I, was, uh, I was amused when I learned that um, cities have personalities. And so it started to click. So Ndola is called a friendly city. Um, Zambians are generally very friendly. Uh, and they'll smile even when they're starving. Um, it's a town that's full of, um, not full, but we've got um, universities now coming up. Uh, we have a government university, which is a, a, a medical school. We've got a uh, private university, uh, not private university, uh, which, um, which is basically business and IT. We've got um, other smaller universities around the city. And so it's, um, it's coming up. But having said that, uh, like my friends have said, it's got its own, own challenges as well. Um, and one of them is basically unemployment. We, we're struggling with that. A lot of uh, young people, the youths, have been to the many colleges we have now, and they have no jobs. Another one is um, to do with um, those who can't get into universities. That's another big problem. Most, most of the Zambians are rushing into government universities because they are highly subsidized. Now they can only take so much and our population is growing. Our population is uh, mostly youthful. Uh, over 50%, over 60% are, are youths in Zambia. And so because of that, we can't find enough places, enough university places, but also they just can't afford to go to university. And so we have that group of people, young people walking around the streets. But we have another set of people who don't make the cut to get into college, any college, because they didn't pass that well, which is the group of my group of interest. 
And um, because high school grades were so low, they, they have to rewrite. And, um, and there's quite a good number of those as well. And they can't go to any college and they can't rewrite because they don't have money. And that's usually the poor people, uh, the poor young people. Those who can't, who didn't make the cut and um, also teenage pregnancies. Uh, we have young people getting pregnant in grade 11 and uh, they get out of school. We have a policy in Zambia where a child who is pregnant can go home, give birth and come back after a year or two. But then after that happens for a poor child, that's it. No parent to say go back to school. So those are my the group of interests that I have uh, here in Dola. I'm trying to work with to see if I can get them into school. They finish off, and maybe they can have a chance to get into into college. I think those are the challenges that I've seen. Um, yeah, in our city. that's great. So some of those things, as you're exegeting your city, uh, those are some great examples of. Um, networking your city getting to know who's there you mentioned a lot of young people uh are are there and a lot of people who are maybe struggling to get into university or or with employment so uh those are great examples of the types of things that you're going to be describing uh and again with these uh deeper level of of thinking questions that we're asking in this exegeting the city document then as a transformational leader coming out of this course, you become a, a connector and a networker between institutions, between sectors of society. Uh, you know, you're, you're constantly kind of being a steward of power, of giving yourself away to people who are struggling, maybe young people who are not, haven't been able to get a job or get into college and connecting them as a transformational leader to opportunities that are there. So I think that's a really great example that you provided, Baxter. Thank you. Thanks. Does anyone else want to share about your city? All right, then we'll keep uh, we'll keep pressing through here. I'm going to uh, share my screen and pull the document back up. These perspectives are kind of interesting. I'm not going to read through all of them, but uh, uh, these, these six perspectives on the city from Dr. Boyce are, are actually really interesting ways to get to know uh, your context. So the temporal perspective of, from history and other perspectives, uh, the sacred perspective, the security perspective. Uh, you know, here in the U.S., they're trying to build a wall and do all kinds of other crazy stuff. Uh, but, but, I mean, that's, that's really... Uh, you know, Americans are kind of obsessed with safety and, and comfort and security. And so it's, it really plays into a lot of um, conversations in our cities here in the U.S. Uh, the economic perspective, I was sharing a little bit about the steel industry in, in Pittsburgh and then uh, some of the shifts that we've made uh, in our uh, economics and manufacturing and industry. Uh, the spatial perspective, uh, from, it comes from the fields of geography and urban planning. A lot of us in this course may not be too interested in the spatial perspective, but actually the built environment is becoming a bigger thing for uh, leaders around the world to focus on, uh, especially what's happening in, in uh, the built environment around housing. You see a lot of this uh, at play with poverty alleviation strategies. Uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, one of the neighborhoods that I've been involved with is called East Liberty, and there's a huge redevelopment that's happening. Uh, more than $100 million has been invested in that particular part of, of town here in Pittsburgh. Uh, and a lot of the developments are uh, focused on the built environment. So you will have uh, three or four levels of housing that are above the street level of these buildings that are being built. And the housing are, are focused on being mixed income housing. So you'll have a certain percentage that are for low income individuals, certain percentage for middle class individuals, and then a certain percentage of those housing uh, units are for uh, high income individuals. And they're all kind of integrated, mixed in throughout the, uh, the location there. 
uh, with the thought process being that one way to help to rise the tide of a city is to make sure that everybody has enough housing and that everybody across the economic spectrum is able to interact with each other uh, and to learn from each other. And then the lower level of many of those buildings would be uh, businesses because people need jobs and places to work and they can walk to their workplace. So you'll see restaurants and office space, uh, all kinds of different things that are happening, uh, exercise gyms, lots of different places that are uh, there, coffee shops and places for people to interact. And uh, it's really fascinating to see uh, how the people who are focused on the built environment are actually uh, focus so much on how, how human beings now in cities are interacting with each other in healthy ways versus in the past, Pittsburgh has a history of development of just building housing for low income individuals or just building housing for high income individuals and a gated community where there, where nobody interacts with one another. Uh, so trying out some new innovative approaches. Uh, when I was in Paris uh, for, um, a United Nations, of, uh, I'm sorry, I wasn't in Paris, I was in Quito, Ecuador for a United Nations event for Habitat 3 uh, a year and a half ago. And I met the deputy mayor of Paris, who uh, they were directly taking on the terrorism problem that they were having in, in Paris by focusing on how people were isolated. Uh, the incoming refugees and, and uh, people that were kind of flooding into the country were isolated from mainstream culture based on the housing that had been set up. Uh, so there were these isolated pockets of people not being able to assimilate into uh, Parisian society. So the deputy mayor there had taken an entire different a leadership approach uh, to building uh, housing and mixed income neighborhoods and mixed uh, ethnicity neighborhoods intentionally in order for assimilation to happen better into uh, the culture there for people who were arriving uh, who were struggling. Uh, so uh, uh, in fact, they opened up a, uh, they were going to do 15 different kind of uh, redevelopment efforts in different parts of the city and they opened up the bidding to different people around the world to uh, with a specific focus on what could you build that would be economically sustainable um, uh, uh, environmentally sustainable and also a good place for people to live that are different from each other to be able to live and thrive together and they had more than a hundred different proposals from around the world uh, from people who were trying to design that, those spaces for them and it worked out really well uh, they're, they're seeing a lot of great results. So just a couple examples there of, of, the, of how you can pay attention to the spatial perspective and the social perspective on how people um, interact with each other, that those play into uh, uh, how we look at cities. Ray Bakke's work on urbanization and urbanism that theme has come up already as we hear from some of our group in this course that's talking about how to respond to rapid urbanization, how the cities are sucking in people from all over the, the country uh, where they're located, and many of the cities are not able to accommodate that type of growth all at once, and we need to have creative responses to how to manage that. But this starts with, you can't come up with a solution to urbanization if you don't understand how urbanization is happening in your local context. So questions like this, what has the city experienced in terms of recent growth trends? How has this impacted the church's focus or methodologies? Um, and then uh, looking at urbanism, this would be the ideas that get sent out of cities that make their way out into the rural areas and other parts and, and small towns um, where the lifestyle, the city as a lifestyle and the city as a process asking those questions. What impact does the city have on its residents in the areas of education, material well-being, housing, religious life, entertainment, attitude, physical well-being, et cetera? Uh, to what extent are its most educated residents staying or leaving? This is a big problem that Pittsburgh had for a long time was brain drain, we called it. Some of our best and brightest were being, they were growing up here, being educated, and then moving away from the city because there were not any jobs here in the local area for them to be able to stay and live and raise their families. So unemployment has been a huge issue for us. When the steel industry started to decline in Pittsburgh, we lost a lot of jobs in manufacturing and industry. And uh, recently, for the first time, I think in the past 30 years, instead of having a population decline in Pittsburgh, we actually stabilized and saw, and saw a little bit of an increase. And a lot of that is because of all the innovative practices that have happened to kind of reinvent the city uh, to keep people staying here and living here. And as you were mentioning, Baxter, uh, those, that concept of uh, you know, employment and connected to education is huge. 
Uh, if you educate people, but there's no jobs for them to have, then that's also a, a big issue. Uh, and then if we look at, um, you know, a specific uh, strategy that Ray Bakke says there, what view do city churches have of the city and their role in it? A bad place we have to save, or is it a place that has assets that we can build upon? Uh, each church is a vantage point in the city having unique constituencies and niches. Uh, niches, sorry. Who are they reaching? How are they reaching them? What are some of the outcomes? What can we learn from each other? Are, are we going to be siloed and just focus on reaching our own people? Or are we going to collaborate with others to help to uh, reach a region? And then the strategies as listed there are go to school principals, pastors, police chaplains, jails, city council persons, mayors, and ask their view of the community. Uh, last week, I had the opportunity to go to Washington, D.C. Uh, here in the U.S. to do some advocacy work for, for youth mentoring. As many of you know, I, I lead a youth mentoring initiative here in Pittsburgh. And uh, so I went to D.C. and I met with our, our House of Representatives uh, leaders and also uh, to our, both of our state senators. And in that time with them, I was just asking them some questions about their hopes and dreams uh, for what they're trying to get accomplished and how I might be able to help participate. And then I was able to share some stories about some things that are going on in my neighborhood in my context and how present some opportunities for them to be able to uh, participate with me. So they were great meetings and I was glad I took a couple of days out of my schedule to go do that. It was well worth it. Um, but uh, in asking them questions, I was able to learn a lot more about the challenges that, are, that our, our state and our local area is facing. Uh, moving down through the document a bit, uh, we are, you know, I'm not going to spend too much time on this next one uh, that Ray talks about the sociological, structural, religious, denominational, financial, and theological sectors of the city. But those are some questions that you can ask uh, in each of those areas, each of those sectors of society. Uh, those are some great questions as you go out and about that you can be thinking through in terms of your research. But what I wanted to focus on a little bit was um, some of uh, what Dr. White highlighted in his book that we worked through last week, Encounter God in the City. If you, uh, I saw some of this, this happening in the online discussions, which was great, as you kind of latched onto uh, this framework that, that Dr. White presented, which is actually from Ben Beltran uh, and some of his research that he's done uh, on the herbs, the civitas, and the anima of the city. The herbs being where we get our word for urban, includes all the physical qualities of the environment, the layout, transportation, sanitation services, boundaries, features, etc. The civitas is where we get our word civic, includes the behaviors of a city, its history, major events, what's, what it's known for, its reputation, its function in the world, and then the anima, our world animation comes, our word animation comes from here. This includes the unconscious universe of its residents, their assumptions, beliefs, ways of thinking. Some call this the soul of the city. And then Dr. White, again, thinking through in this transformational leadership course, we would like for you to, uh, to really focus on, um, we would like for you to really focus on the herbs and the civitas and the anima of your city. You can go through and you can use these different questions that, that Dr. White presents uh, to be able to uh, get to know your city a little bit more. So I just got an email from uh, Dr. Smith here. Just a moment. Yeah, that's what I was saying. <laughs> uh, Brad, are you uh, able to join us? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close out of the screen here just a second. Okay, um, so let me email... Uh, Let me email him back and I th hopefully he can join us. So while he's, while he's joining us here, uh, and I just kind of blazed through that content, uh, but again, uh, just, to, just to reiterate, these are all tools for you. I'm not expecting you to do the entire document as you unpack your city and get to know your city and exegete your city. Uh, but it would be great if you could use some of those tools in there uh, to be able to go to know your city a little bit better. 
Does anybody want to share while we're waiting for uh, Dr. White uh, about the herbs, the civitas, or the anima of your city? Was there anything that stuck out with that that you wanted to share about your local context? <laughs> Quiet bunch. Any questions in general about the uh, the concept of exegeting your city and how you might apply that to uh, your uh, final project that you're going to be doing? So you in your groups, you're going to be helping each other to uh, you're going to be helping each other in your groups to be able to um, to go through the uh, the content or to be able to pick which ones you're going to utilize for. Uh, for your final project that you're going to do. And then in the group project towards the end of the course, you're going to have a five to 10 minute presentation individually. So let's say that your group has three people. In it. And uh, if your group has uh, three people in it, then you will uh, share briefly for just five to 10 minutes about how you exegeted your city and, um, and some of the uh, outcomes that you had. And then when you get into your individual project at the end of the course, you will write out more extensively about that experience. So, hey, Dr. Smith, welcome. Uh, we're having a hard time hearing you. So I don't know, uh, Brad, can you uh, say hi to the course, to the group? Oh, we're still having a hard time hearing you here. I, I'm not hearing anything come through. I can see you. Sorry about that. I had to change oh. out. We were oh, doing okay. another. <laughs> apologize. I was on another conference call, and so I used a different set of speakers for a larger conference, so I apologize for that. I had to change it out. No problem. My we, apologies. Uh, I, I've gotten a lot of requests for evening meetings, and so I did not realize it was 9 p.m., so my, it was <laughs> out of the local. So I, I deeply apologize for that. No problem at all. We're thrilled that you're able to join us uh, for a little while here today. Uh, we have um, uh, a great group on here. Uh, I, as I, I think as I share with you, we have uh, nine or 10 students from around the world. I think we have seven of them or eight of, uh, that have been kind of in and out on, the, on this Zoom room. So we just uh, uh, went through a document that I sent to students on exegeting their city and getting to know their city, which is their group project and their final project. And uh, without any further ado, though, they're ready to hear from you. They're working through your book this week, and uh, they're anxious to hear from you. So uh, I don't know if you want to do introductions with everyone or not, or if you just want to jump right in. Well, I know Baxter and I know Star. Um, so, and I, I see Joe. I, have no, I don't think I've met Joe before. So hi, Joe. So where are you, where are you calling in from, Joe? I'm from Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe, okay. Are you good, good to meet you, Joe? <clears throat> so hi Baxter. Thank you. Thank you. And so um Bekele, I don't know that I met you. I, I don't know your last name, so Bekele, we we met actually um on the first course I took. Okay. I thought you were that Bekele. Bekele is kind of a common name in Ethiopia. So we Yeah, so we, many Bekeles. I was just actually <laughs> talking to Bekele Shanko earlier today. So uh, this is Bakele Tulu. Yeah, he's from. Yeah. And then Florine. Oh, uh, Florine's uh, microphone isn't working, but she's been chatting with us, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Smith. So you'll be able to see her in yeah. the chat section. So let, I'll just jump in. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, the, the what we did with that the city signals is basically I filmed uh, Ray Baki. Um, and filmed him in Dallas. And then as a result of it, I was trying to get those that published. And so our publisher said, the only way you can publish it is if you have a standalone book that the book would be written uh, even with or without the video series. So if you notice, City Signals has a video series and some say good, some of it doesn't. And so because of that, we had to do the book in a way that it actually is not sequential. It actually follows and reflects upon his uh, DVD series, which was not sequential. 
So it's one of those books you can almost read chapter one, chapter eight, chapter five. You don't really have to read it in a particular order, which I know makes it a little bit confusing, but it was because we were using the book, uh, wrote the book in order to get the video series uh, published. And it's gone a little bit better than we thought. It got the, an award uh, in, in terms of the year, I think because it just covers some topics. I think one of the topics that we can jump into is um, we were dealing with in that book a lot of people who get involved in urban ministry and begin to ask the questions, what, the, what is the motive for being involved in urban ministry? And I think, uh, and I'll just jump in, y'all can jump in, but the, the, what we found is a lot of di diverse motives. So every one of us wants to help. Every one of us wants to be significant and do a significant work for God, to steward God's gifts for us. But with those positive and, and generous motives also come mixed motives in which uh, Chris Rock will talk about um, a lot of times that he is a, as a, uh, an Anglo male in the United States says for him, um, he got involved in urban ministry for a lot of good motives, but one of his bad motives was he was an emotionally suppressed person and he just enjoyed being in the urban setting where there was, uh, he could live vicariously through other people's more emotionally expressive um, cultures in life. Other people will get involved and they enjoy being at a place where they're listened to because typically they may have more knowledge, more um, money. And so they come in with a power differential and they enjoy being at a place where they have power, where in other places they don't. Um, other times there's a need to be needed. And so one of the chapters in City Signals is just to help us to, first of all, normalize that. Our motives will be positive, but there's often this side of the New Jerusalem, a dark side to our motives. And to be able to express that, because if we're not aware of that, often we can be oppressive uh, to those that we most love and most want to care for, and to be open to those conversations. And so that's uh, one of the things that we can talk about today, is that getting involved in urban ministry, getting involved with those that are the least, the last, and the lost, often and almost normative, we will have mixed motives. And um, we will have mixed motives this side of the New Jerusalem. So for us to admit that, so when we preach, often God protects others from our motives. But we also recognize when we're driving home or walking home, we, we kind of start saying, wow, I wish I'd done it this way. There's fear. Or there's a sense of, wow, I made them laugh. I made them impact. And all of a sudden, we start being aware of ourselves. And so it's those kind of moments then preaching, caring for, loving on other people that we need to be aware of our mixed motives and be able to have a safe place to talk about that and to recognize, to normalize that so that we can protect others from that. So let me stop at that point. You'll see that in the chapter. Um, any thoughts on that? Do you experience mixed motives? And if so, how do you deal with that? And where do you talk about those mixed motives in a way that helps protect those you care for and love uh, and serve? Uh, from it being impacted by that. Any thoughts on that? And Star, you are very reflective and you are one of, uh, you can speak up. So Star, I'm going to call on you if you don't mind. Sorry for, <laughs> I'm used to your being forthright. And, and, right. Uh, so. <laughs> um, well, the first thing that came to my mind was um, working with the foster youth and being a foster youth. Mm -hmm. or being, you know, a former foster youth. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure that my feelings and my um, experience does not stand in the way of theirs. Mm -hmm. And so, a lot of times, it, because you have a compassion toward their plight, because you do, in a way that's unique, there's a passion to help them overcome some of the things that you had to face. And that's a, that's a positive God-given experience. What happens though is when anger comes in, because the system is bad, there's no doubt about that. And there's people in the system that are bad. There's systems that are good. And so there's a sense that sometimes the feelings perhaps of anger, of loneliness, of shame, of fear um, that you would project upon others, a lot of times that's real, that's actually accurate. But other times you've got to stop and listen to say, you know, where am I projecting and where am I not listening to them? Does that make sense? Yes. How, thank how you. do you describe that interaction in your own head? Because a lot of that's self-aware, just being self-aware. How do you do that? And how do you have a community that helps you do that? Mm -hmm. 
Any thoughts on that? Do you have people that you can talk about that with? Sorry, may maybe we hit your microphone wrong. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Repeat the question. Just how do you do? You have a community or uh, some safe people you can talk to about that. I do. Okay. I do. And how do they help? How did you find the safe community, and how do you work with them so they don't shame you? They recognize it's normative and just help you through that. How do, how did you compose them, and how do you? you know how do you work with them in a positive way not a negative way um i'm very transparent and um very empathetic and very reflective as you said um so people just allow me to be myself mm -hmm. and um i i want the truth i'm, I'm in search of my true self and um, basically so just invite. talking. So you invite it. So when somebody says, you know, Star, I think I see some mixed motives here, you say, bring it on. Tell me yes. about it. Yes, yes. That's key. That's key. One thing that's also in City Signals is how God often gives us a love for things that other people don't love. And so one of the things that I discovered in just part of my story is I just fell in love with the neighborhood that other people were scared of. Um, they fell in love with people that other people, and it's just, a, it's a God-given love. And it's it's not something that you can say you you orchestrated, but God does that. And I'm assuming, Star, and I'm picking on you, Star, because you're articulate, um, and I, I know from the past <laughs> courses. Tell us a little bit how that love has developed. That Because to go back in, a lot of people say, if I've been in a difficult situation, the last thing I want to do is experience that in the rest of my life. And they get out of town. They get out of the city. They get away from that. Wow. And yet you go back in and there's a love and a compassion you have. Describe how that, how that feels and why that's not just something you do out of duty. You actually enjoy being in caring for foster care um, recipients. I just believe it is the love of God for the people. Mm -hmm. I truly believe that it is his love for them minus my thoughts and my love, which I love as well. But my love, of course, you know, is not a perfect love. Mm -hmm. So just um, tapping into that love of Christ for the people is where I stay. And are sometimes are you surprised by your motives or so unusually pure? I mean, it's just, that's kind of the point of urban ministry sometimes. There's a dark side to motive you have to be aware of, but other times you go, wow, right. I don't know where this came from. I just have a pure motive of love. I enjoy this. Right. Just that a little bit, if you don't mind. Um, there's just so many different things going around in my head right now because of the place that I am at right now because of BGU. Um, my life is transforming, and it's just amazing to see um, so much more than I thought I saw. Mm -hmm. So, um, um there's just, there's just too many. There's, I'm, I'm just, I'm falling in love with Jesus and falling in love with my city and with the passion that he's given me uh, in a broader sense. I can now see exactly what everything was about in my whole life. So just basically just a yielding and being, you know, humble to the Lord. Thank you. Thank you for letting me pick on you a little bit. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else uh, describe a little bit about uh, the mixed motives that you face and how you become aware of that, but also this just unexplainable love that you find in loving often difficult places and difficult people. And you realize it's not you, it doesn't make sense, but it's just you enjoy it. Anybody else has a way to describe that in your own setting? So Joe, since I can see you, I'm going to pick on you. So Joe, any way that you describe that in your city? Yeah, I, I find it um, quite a big challenge um, to, in terms of the feelings, uh, the challenge will be to have pure motives. Mm -hmm. Because of my condition, because of my bias towards sin, and maybe I want to do it for self-glory. I want to do it for attention. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's hard to be incarnational in the true sense of the word. Um, so I think it's, it's, it just requires God's grace to help me to do that exactly. Amen. In a way that, that would please and bring glory to him. Amen. It's not an easy space to be in. It's very honest. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And so when you do find the motives are mixed, uh, do you have a group of friends like Star has that you've invited to say, you know, I think you were going after, you did some good things there, but there was, there was a time you kind of went over the edge and really started going for attention. How does, how does that work? How did you build that community? How do you invite them to speak into your lives to help, help you love others better? Um, are you still uh, you seeing me on the floor? <laughs> yeah, just how did you uh, I, how did you okay. build that community? Same question I asked Star. How okay. did you build I, that community? I, Go ahead. I have I have friends and uh, mentors, people who are around me who hold me accountable. Mm -hmm. So it's it's easy for them to actually tell me exactly where things are. Mm -hmm. They have nothing to lose. So instead of being defensive, I'm prepared to to accept the rebukes and the corrections um, so I can move forward. So yes, I, over the years, I've built a group of guys around me who tell me, who call a spade a spade in my life. So that's, that's the way to go. That's good. That's, that's, good. Yeah. Yeah. that's so critical. And I know there is uh, somebody that I was uh, working with and mentoring in an urban setting. And at some point after about a year, um, I was noticing that I don't think we were making any progress. And somebody else that was watching us said, Brad, I think after the time you've invested in this person, they have less confidence in their own ability than when you started. And, you know, this is somebody I love. And having them speak into my life, and they were right. They were right. I had created a dependence. And it wasn't just their choice. It was mostly my choice. I had enjoyed creating the dependence. It made me feel important. But having somebody said, you've actually made them worse. This very person that you love so much and you invested so much time into it, you have demonstrated you love yourself more than you love them. And as a result, they're actually less uh, capable, less empowered, um, less healthy than when you started. And those were honest words and uh, exactly honest words. And uh, I needed to hear that. But I don't think I could have seen this unless somebody else had spoken it to me. It just broke my heart, um, even to this day, uh, watching how, largely unaware, um, I had really hurt somebody that I cared and I loved for deeply. And uh, I think that's a trap that we all get into. And I think it's very hard for us to see it ourselves. So thank you for your honesty, Joe, about that. Anybody else? How do you have um, either unexplainable love for those that are, most people don't understand why you love them or the, the region or the neighborhood, as well as a place to go to explore the mixed motives. It normally will happen as we care and, and we, we minister. Any thoughts on that? So Baxter, I know how you share, so I want to call on you, Baxter. So what, have you, what do you think about that? Where do you find that, Baxter, kind of an unexplainable love? Um, in education, but also uh, ways that you check your your mixed motives. So Baxter, go ahead. Hi, Dr. Smith. Good to see you. Yo, uh, I really I don't know where to start from. Um, I, I was struggling to, to get you, but I think you're talking about um, where you, you, you love somebody and you don't know why. Is, is that what you're saying? Or you love somebody who other people say are unlovable and you go, there's something in me. Or you love a neighborhood that other people say, why don't you leave that neighborhood? It's a horrible neighborhood. You go, I, I, I'm in love with it. I, I love the smells. I love the dirt. I love the, the anarchy. I love all of that. I don't know why, but it's just there. And I know that God has put it there. Okay. Um, yeah, I've got an example of uh, not so much the neighborhood, but uh, um, a person um, I worked with uh, um, maybe five, ten years ago, and I'm still in touch with him. Um, he's a kind of uh, person where everybody thinks uh, he's bad. <laughs> this man belongs in jail. 
or something like that. Um, but yeah, he he came into my life through a work situation, and uh, we got on together. All right. Um, yes, I would invite him to church, and I found myself working with him um, in, in the office. And so everybody was saying, "What? What do you have in common?" A lot of differences to begin with is I think six foot something, and I'm almost half his height. <laughs> All right, but also um, um, I'm a Christian, and it's very clear that this person um, uh, is struggling. But somehow um, I've stuck around. I've stuck around with him. Uh, he, he's come out uh, saying um, uh, he. I've helped him. He thinks I've helped him uh, because he thinks um, he's able to at least go to church. I'm not sure he's a convert yet, uh, but at least he's able to go to church. He's, um, he's kept with his wife. Everybody was thinking he would leave his wife, but he's kept with his wife. Why did I stick around? I still don't know. I still don't know. Um, at, uh, at a at an expense of even maybe um, uh, I myself being written off, if you if you see what I mean, where people are saying, "What do you have in common? How come we see you together? You know, what do you talk about and things like that?" Uh, but eventually, um, I, I left town. But every so often, he calls me. He often calls me. I call him sometimes also, trying to find out what he's doing. How his family is doing? Um, pretty much, yeah. I, I gave an excuse that um, look, um, if we don't befriend non-believers, how are we going to evangelize? I'm not sure it was <laughs> it was the right excuse, um, but that was the excuse I was giving. And every time there was invitation to church they say invite non-believers because it's an evangelistic session i had an unbeliever to invite and that was him i know he said the, the, the gospel i'm not sure how far it has impacted his life what's what's good is you know there's a duty to do evangelism somebody like that but when it becomes enjoyable it becomes a love it becomes something you look forward to you begin to realize that God has done something in your heart. And uh, yes, you've made good decisions. There's a character there. But God often leads us when we're working with the least, the last, and the lost to move beyond duty, to just have this weird love and enjoyment, an odd enjoyment. People look at us and go, why? And so it's a love that we can't necessarily explain except from God. But even in that, there's going to be mixed motives. And so just being aware to celebrate a non-logical love, but also to have a community that can point out our mixed motives is important. And um, but appreciate you sharing that. I see from Florine, she's talking about working with the children. And Florine, part of it is you have an, a righteous indignation, which is a good motive, to say they're hurting each other um, because they're not making an effort. And so there's an anger that's a pure anger, a good anger but also probably mixed with that, at least it would be in my case, there's an impatience that comes from a sense that perhaps they're wasting your time or, or you're not being able to, your gifts are being blocked by their lack of effort. And so being aware of that, part of it is a righteous God-given anger for, um, for them not making enough effort, that's genuine. But also where's the mixed motives that all of us have where there's an impatience and being aware of that, being in community, having people that care for you that you invite to share to say, Florine, that was good. That was righteous anger. But you notice how the impatience went a little bit much. And so that you can love on these children and on their parents. I think the idea of working with their parents makes a lot of sense. But it's just being self-aware. That's really the point of the, that chapter in City Signals. Because otherwise, we can really hurt those we, we love. And being self-aware of God's supernatural love, but also self-aware of the, no the normal. Everybody has a mixed motives that we have in the midst of urban ministry and caring for those that, are, that, are, that need, need our help. So that's good. Thank you for describing that. I think that's good. 
Yeah, I'm often told they're wasting my time. That's other people that don't get it. And you go, you don't get it. There's a love inside. And so that's that's right. That shows you that that's where you are. So Joe, go ahead. What, what do you think? I've been brought up by the tradition that if you don't give people fish, but teach them how to fish. So as a result, that has impacted on my feelings in terms of reaching out to the disadvantaged people. You, you don't want just to give, give, give. Uh, because like in my situation, in my own country, in my city, we have a, a, a population of people, a group of people who seem to become very, they're con artists. So they can take advantage of your, of your good heart, of your love for the Lord. So the feeling of feeling uh, being uh, used or being um, just, just being taken advantage of because of your love for the Lord, uh, it, it becomes very difficult, very dicey in terms of trying to reach out and make a difference in people's lives. But nevertheless, because of the love of Christ in me, I, I feel constrained to reach out nevertheless, but at the same time, I feel also limited to, to go all the way because of certain people who want to take advantage of our stance for, for the Lord. So I thought I would share that. Very well said, Joe. Thank you. This is where it really is difficult because sometimes people just need to be given a fish, you know, um, but other times that's the worst thing for them. It creates a dependence. This is where self-awareness, because sometimes we have a need to give somebody a fish because it makes us feel important. We've met a need. They say, thank you, thank you, thank you. Other times we need to say, tough love. No, I'm not going to give you a fish. I'm actually going to help you, but you've got to make a difference. Now they say, I reject you because you're not giving me what you gave me before. And you have to face rejection. But yet the rejection that you're facing from them is the most loving thing. What you did to get that rejection is the most loving thing. This is where self-awareness says, when am I creating codependency is a phrase that the psychologists use where I need to be needed. And where am I not loving people by making them dependent upon me? <clears throat> and when do I need to, and when am I afraid to just say, no, I'll empower you, I'll equip you, but I won't give you the fish. And you are, under, you're afraid to do that <clears throat> because of uh, facing rejection. And this is where in urban ministry, it's that self-awareness, awareness of God, what God is calling us to do is so important to know when do we give somebody a fish? When do we teach them to fish? And um, you know how that illustration, we use that a lot inside of BGU because of the economic development pieces we have. That we say, <clears throat> what if, um, you know, they heard the story, give somebody a fish and they, they eat for a day, teach them to fish, they eat for a lifetime. But what if the pond is polluted and nobody can fish there? There are no fish. What if there's a fence around that pond and only people of a certain race or color or gender can fish there? What if uh, there, you could fish there, but there's a war going on and you would be caught in the crossfire? And so what we want to do <clears throat> in relief, development, and advocacy is to help basically those that are, live around the pond to own the pond, to clean it up, to be in control of their own pond. And so that's where business development and advocacy advocating for changing systems of evil, which often keep that pond uh, from being active and just teaching somebody to fish may not work if it's in a, a system of evil. And so that's why our business programs, our advocacy programs, our economic development programs are so important as part of this. But it still takes self-awareness to be able to move and to be able to stand up and fight an injustice, but also to know when not to fight and when to say no, and yet also when to say yes. Um, and that's hard. And also community. It's all about a community that helps us discern that. But Joe, thank you for describing that. Um, good. Tim, Tim, Tim Rabi, I see what you're writing. I'm sorry that you're having internet issues. Um, so the owner of the house of my church, he gets angry. Yes. Um, which is interesting. And this is where the compassion toward this person so think about it. Most of us are driven by feelings, fear, perhaps, shame, guilt, pain, loneliness. And so when we see somebody acting toward us, often behind that is one of those feelings is dominating them. And so perhaps having compassion toward that owner of uh, saying, OK, I'm hearing the words. You shouldn't park here. and I'm angry at you. But to say, tell us a little bit about why. What are you, well, it's not right. Okay, 
Um, but try to say, are they afraid of being taken advantage of? Or are they looking at the church and they're lonely that they're not included? Or are they uh, shamed that um, perhaps somebody is using their yard and they've been shamed about that? And so part of it is that compassion as you minister to this person opens up an opportunity not just to hear their words and to change their behavior, but to actually hear what's going on in their emotions that's driving that behavior. There's no way we can do that unless we're aware of our own emotions and what's driving our behavior that keeps us from really going in, they call it emotional intelligence, and listening and having compassion to the feelings, the conversation below the conversation of why somebody's fighting us or why somebody's being dependent upon us. Um, and that's where being in an urban ministry, being self-aware, and you can't, you can't read other people's motives, but really listening and being having compassion toward the fear, perhaps the pain, the loneliness that's driving their defensive or angry behavior towards you just changes everything. It disables them. It disarms them in a way that God's love through you can get through to them. But again, it's about listening, being self-aware, and only from there can you have compassion and awareness toward what's happening in their hearts as well. So let me stop at that point. Any, any comments on that where you've seen that work? And Brian, jump in too. You, you know how to do this and you may have some good stories. Compassion yeah. toward the feelings behind the action. Yeah. Can you hear me? Dr. Brian. You can. Uh, doc, doc, can you hear me? Go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um I let me complete my statement. Yeah. After a while, the man had issues with electricity. So electricity had issues. So he had to dig through my compound for him to repair the electricity. So I saw who dig my compound. I have to stop them and ask them, why are you doing this? And they explained to me, I said, well, there should be a procedure of doing this. So the man came down and paid me that to allow them to dig, and electricity is bad. So I gave them go ahead to dig and um, mess up my compound. After the finish, I repaired myself. And since then, relationship has been very good. This evening, I visited, we shared ideas together. And today, this day, he came to my house to visit me to share some things with me. He shares us and supports us in just even if he's not coming there, he now supports us a lot. I think uh, what you have shared uh, really is, I showed him love. Uh, allow him to dig my compound, and that's the whole uh, issue of anger and pain. Uh, from there, it does not visit him. So that was just to conclude the story. So as you showed him love, there was a sense that you saw that inside of yourself. Sometimes people receive it and they don't. Um, sometimes they, they don't believe it. They don't trust it. They have fear. They have issues in their own past. So I heard most of what you said, but not 100%. But thank you for sharing that. It was very helpful. Very helpful. Uh I'll jump in, uh, Dr. Smith. Uh, for when I first, I, I've shared with the class some of my context in Pittsburgh and in the Homewood neighborhood. Uh, when I first uh, went through BGU's program and learned about moving into the community, I did. And I was putting all this pressure on myself to break into a neighborhood that was socioeconomically and ethnically different than anything I had ever experienced. And so the, the first year or two were kind of filled with a lot of tepidly finding my way, experiencing rejection, uh, shame for not being as effective as I had hoped to be. Uh, thankfully, BGU had you know, helped me to take a lot of that pressure off and just ask good questions and listen and be present. Uh, and then one day there was, a, there was a shooting that happened right around the corner and a couple of the kids came over and, and said, you know, uh, that I had been reaching out to and said, hey, this happened, can we have a safe place to stay in your house? We don't wanna go home. They asked me to walk them home after about a half hour or so, and the police were there. And the, the neighbors over there who I had 
experienced rejection from saw me and, and asked me to pray with them and kind of invited me into their pain. Um, and then, uh, the interesting thing about that is I had a huge breakthrough in that moment and was walked them in, in, into their, their homes. And, uh, but then there was some pride that came with that of me being looked to as a person in the neighborhood then who was a, a pastoral figure who had authority. And whenever I would go by, it became a point of, um, I had to check my motives with the dark side that then was coming out with the good feelings I was having <laughs> in the neighborhood and wanting people, well, why did you go run to that guy when I'm just right around the corner and I'm here and, so it, these emotions constantly, to this day, it's been 12 years of investing in the neighborhood, but it's constantly having to check my motives and be self-aware. And then as you noted, the complex issues that we face that there just are no pat answers to, uh, that, that we have to constantly use our emotional intelligence as leaders to process the situations and help to somehow move things forward. So. Thank you. Thank you. And that's, that's honesty to kind of be aware of, of motives. And so just, I'll, I'll be, I'll share, Brian, I grew up in a very legalistic uh, denomination. And so there's a shame thing that's inside of me that comes out of my background. And so if you say to me, uh, Brad, uh, that's a blue shirt. Okay. There is something inside of me sometimes that I might go, Oh, what's wrong with it? Am I, am I, did I pick the wrong shirt out? Um, and you're like going, no, I just said, that's a blue shirt. It's a blue shirt. It's all I said is it's a blue shirt. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing right with it. It's a blue shirt. And so a lot of us that came out of religious backgrounds will have this shame message inside of us. It's, it's not healthy. So when somebody says, um, I'm not ready for you to, uh, to lead this effort in our neighborhood, um, we go, oh, what's wrong with it? I should have been doing this. The, the person in the neighborhood next to me is doing that. And the, the issue is, no, because you're new. You're white. The rest of us are not white. We really don't want that at this point. Um, and there's nothing wrong with you. We actually like you, but it's not time for you to do this. So all of a sudden I go, what's wrong with me? What's wrong? What's what? There's nothing wrong. It's just the nature of the complexity of urban ministry. And yet when I start then all of a sudden getting shamed about it, then I try to start making an effort to say, oh, I can convince you. I can convince you. you go, you're not going to convince us. You just need more time. That's it. You know? Just relax. Uh, we'll get there, but don't feel all ashamed. Don't push this on us. Don't be all energetic to have to be the, the man. You're not, and you won't be, at least not for a while, but let's just watch it for a little. So if you notice how shame that it can create this weirdness that makes us not helpful in the neighborhood. Now, certainly I experienced that. But when I'm aware, when somebody says, no, we don't want you to do this, just to go, I'm feeling shame. I can't get rid of that feeling. Grew up with it, right? But to stop it at that point saying, thank you, thank you, I'm just glad to be here. And to not push the shame back on somebody by either trying to overcome it or push it on them or get defensive, just to go, I have the feeling, I can't get rid of the feeling, but I can manage it in healthy ways when I'm aware of it. If I'm not aware of it, then I can't manage it in healthy ways. And so those are just, just some observations about self-awareness of the dark side that helps us to be more loving in an urban context. Just, you know, it just helps me. Any other thoughts on that, y'all? Some of y'all think when we said shame, you kind of, those of us from religious context, we kind of sometimes get that. <laughs> any, any thoughts on that? That makes sense. Go ahead, Joe. How can I be successfully um, achieve self-awareness um, in my, in myself as a human being? I thought maybe, there's need for dependence on the Holy Spirit to help me um, attain that self-awareness. Because if I, if I do soul searching myself, I, I, don't think, I don't think I'll be quite successful. So I, I need that dependency on the Holy Spirit who is able to actually bring that awareness in myself. Then I realize, wow, okay, forgive me, Lord, help me. I thought I would just bring that up. Was my self-awareness is, is tainted with sin. There's not, there's not much success I can achieve um, in, in trying to be self-aware of myself. I don't know if I'm making sense. Oh, absolutely. So the, you know, the, the Bible says the heart is deceitful, okay? And it's, I, I personally believe that you, exactly what you said, you pray to the Holy Spirit for awareness. But for me, my journey, and I think I heard this from Star as well, 
the Holy Spirit can, because nothing can constrict the Holy Spirit, can say, here it is, Joe, this is what I need you to learn about yourself. I have found he actually does that through other people. But the way that he does that is I pray, but I also invite, like Star said, tell it to me. Give me the bad news. And then sometimes I'll say, when you give me the bad news, I will be defensive and that's wrong. Okay. So okay. give me some time with the bad news to get defensive and then go to go, okay, Brad, let's give you some time and let's talk about it again. And then to try to come back and say, okay, I was defensive the other day. That hurt, but it was a good hurt. It's a friend who loves me. Tell me more about what you saw. Tell me more about the mixed motives. Tell me more about what happened. And so I may not always be just receptive the first time you say it. Please don't give up on me. I really do want to hear. I don't want to hear the truth, but I do want to hear the truth. Um, and to create that community. I find the Holy Spirit, when we pray, please reveal the motives of my heart. He will do that, but he does that through other people. And it's a painful process, but also a, ref a freeing process. We have to okay. invite other people, safe people, not because, as you know, there's a lot of non-safe people that will utilize that as leverage to get their way. And you've got to find the safe people. And when you have know somebody safe, you go, okay, that was what you said was true. But the way you said it is not good. You know, so it's a, it's a journey. It's a journey of okay. being vulnerable. Um, and Thank if you. somebody doesn't get that, then you say, okay, I don't think I'm open to you exactly because you have an agenda with it. Um, but sometimes that counter helps them to realize, yeah, I have an agenda and I need to be careful with that as well. But I do think community is so important effective urban ministry, inviting people to, to, to share with us what they see. So Thank in you. prayer, like you said, invite the Holy Spirit. That's so important. That's key. So any other thoughts, Joe? That's thank you. That was right on. Very much the point. <clears throat> Anybody else? So we, ha we have just a few more minutes here, uh, Dr. Smith, and thank you for joining us, but I, I want to keep it open here. Any, any other thoughts or comments? To, uh, um, so Joe's got his hand up again. <laughs> my, yeah, my last thing, uh, uh, in, Af in Africa, as African people here, we have depended so much on donor funding and it has, it has destroyed our dignity. And as a result, we suffer a lot from low self-esteem. I think, I, I, I speak generally. Um, so in terms of uh, the kind of ministry that we want to do, how do you... How, how do you work that out? Because, you know, book, you talked about theology of place. You talked about incarnational ministry. And, and so I, I need help there. Um, thank, you. thank you for sharing that. And I think, you know, Baxter has gone through our fundraising class. Some of it is learning some skills. Um, and so one of the things we try to do in our summer fundraising class, Star has too, I think, is to say, if somebody says, uh, Joe, are you a fundraiser? There's a part of you that goes, ah, no, because fundraising equals begging. And you go, but at, at the end of that class, we want people to say is, yes, I'm a fundraiser. I am a fundraiser. I'm called by God to raise fund and raise capital. I'm not apologizing for being a fundraiser. It's a discipleship ministry. It's a ministry that God calls to. And because of my fundraising, I get to empower and equip so many other people. It's a skill I want to learn. I'm never going to apologize for it. It's what God has called me to do. I get to steward. It is a delight to be a fundraiser. So yes, I am a fundraiser. And some of it is changing that. And we try to do that in the course is to have a sense of fundraising is a God-given call. And then, of course, we do a lot in the area of business, just learning business development. How do you rethink so that work is not wrong? Uh, Business is not wrong. And so part of it is knowledge. Part of it is identity and then helping others to have the same because there's business opportunities and fundraising opportunities and capital raising opportunities in Africa that are just amazing. Um, I also find humor is a little bit. There's a YouTube video that talks about Africans sending refrigerators to people in Norway uh, because they need refrigerators. Um, and it, the, there's a joke about it saying, all these white people in Norway just need to have more refrigerators because they're poor and they don't have refrigerators. And, uh, and the part of the joke, it's a joke, is saying it's cold in Norway, is it's, re, it's kind of a parody on all these silly videos that say, oh, send 
you know, people in Africa need help, they need help. And it's a, it's a smack back saying, here's a parody of people in Norway need refrigerators, they need help, they need help. Those of us in Africa need to give them refrigerators. And I like the humor of it because it makes people that have gotten into this mindset of all people in Africa are needy to watch their own country. And, you know, of course, vicariously, I think people in the United States are seeing this. Wow, that seems silly for people to say from another continent that everybody in my continent is needy and needs my help. Uh, and it helps us, hopefully, I like the humor of it, to kind of stop and check our motives. It also helps, I've found Africans that I've shown the video, they laugh about it because they go, you know what, that's exactly right. It makes us feel like we have needs. We actually don't have needs like that. And it's kind of fun to push it back at the, you know, at the folks in the Northern Hemisphere and, and white cultures to say, look how silly your videos are when they portray us by seeing how silly this video is and how it portrays you. And um, you know, I can find the YouTube video. I think it's funny. Um, but humor sometimes helps us to see a truth um, yeah. in new ways. Thank you. All right, anyone else while you have uh, BJU's president on the line, here's your opportunity. Any other questions, comments? <laughs> Everyone make I, I, I apologize for my mistake for being late. I so I'm so sorry. That was you you were very clear. It was my fault. So I very much apologize. For that. <laughs> no problem. It was great having you with us and I have the recording so some of the uh, everyone who missed or uh, didn't catch part of it um, we'll be able to join, uh, hear the recording. And again, we were going to go over the executing the city document anyway, so it ended up working out. So thank you for being gracious. You're being kind. <laughs> <laughs> Would you mind closing us in uh, prayer, Dr. Smith, uh, as we wrap up here? Father, we just thank you that you give us a love that passes understanding, and you give us a love that confuses other people, and you give us just a love that confuses us as we care for people that tend to look unlovable or neighborhoods that just tend to be unlovable and neighborhoods that people would want to leave. And yet, Father, you give us a love for them. And uh, we can't explain it in our own character. We can't explain it in our own will. We can only explain it because you have been gracious through us to show your love to others. But Father, we also recognize that this side of the New Jerusalem, we will have mixed motives. And uh, Father, that's the sin that we have. In the sin nature, yes, you are cleaning us out. You are sanctifying us. You are removing so many awful motives. And yet that, that work will not be completed until uh, the new Jerusalem. And in the meantime, Father, give us an awareness. We come before you and say we want to know our sin. And give us loving friends that help us to discern and to know our sin as your Holy Spirit works with us. We call out, Father, we want to be pure instruments of you. Clean our hearts out. Help us to understand our mixed motives. Father, thank you for those in this class, their deep commitment to you, their deep commitment to your work. Thank you for Brian and his leadership, his skill, and just his love for the students in this class. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, everybody. I'll see you in the online discussions. Thank you. Joe, you had your hand raised. Is there one last thing you wanted to say? I just wanted to say thank you for an amazing book. Uh, I've read that book. It's, uh, I've just I've just enjoyed the book and been chatting so much. Thank you so much for putting that book together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your encouragement. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Bye, Star. Good to good to hear from you and see you. Good to see you, Baxter. So good to see you, Doc. <laughs> good to meet the rest of y'all. Okay. Right. Bye bye. Right. Bye bye. Bye bye, everyone.